Of opposition to United States involvement in the Vietnam War began with demonstrations in 1964 against the escalating role of the U.S. military in the Vietnam War and grew into a broad social movement over the ensuing several years. This movement informed and helped shape the vigorous and polarizing debate, primarily in the United States, during the second half of the 1960s and early 1970s on how to end the war. Many in the peace movement within the U.S. were students, mothers, or anti-establishment hippies. Opposition grew with participation by the African American civil rights, women's liberation, and Chicano movements, and sectors of organized labor. Additional involvement came from many other groups, including educators, clergy, academics, journalists, lawyers, physicians, such as Benjamin Spock, and military veterans. Their actions consisted mainly of peaceful, nonviolent events, few events were deliberately provocative and violent. In some cases, police used violent tactics against peaceful demonstrators. By 1967, according to Gallup polls, an increasing majority of Americans considered U.S. military involvement in Vietnam to be a mistake, echoed decades later by the then head of American war planning, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Topic. Reasons The draft, a system of conscription that mainly drew from minorities and lower and middle class whites, drove much of the protest after 1965. Conscientious objectors played an active role despite their small numbers. The prevailing sentiment that the draft was unfairly administered inflamed blue collar American, especially African American, opposition to the military draft itself. Opposition to the war arose during a time of unprecedented student activism, which followed the free speech movement and the civil rights movement. The military draft mobilized the baby boomers, who were most at risk, but it grew to include a varied cross-section of Americans. The growing opposition to the Vietnam War was partly attributed to greater access to uncensored information through extensive television coverage on the ground in Vietnam. Beyond opposition to the draft, anti-war protesters also made moral arguments against U.S. involvement in Vietnam. That moral imperative argument against the war was especially popular among American college students, who were more likely than the general public to accuse the United States of having imperialistic goals in Vietnam and to criticize the war as immoral. Civilian deaths, which were downplayed or omitted entirely by the Western media, became a subject of protest when photographic evidence of casualties emerged. An infamous photo of General Nguyen Ngoc Loan shooting an alleged terrorist in handcuffs during the Tet Offensive also provoked public outcry. Another element of the American opposition to the war was the perception that U.S. intervention in Vietnam, which had been argued as acceptable because of the domino theory and the threat of communism, was not legally justifiable. Some Americans believed that the communist threat was used as a scapegoat to hide imperialistic intentions, and others argued that the American intervention in South Vietnam interfered with the self-determination of the country and felt that the war in Vietnam was a civil war that ought to have determined the fate of the country and that America was wrong to intervene. Media coverage of the war also shook the faith of citizens at home as new television brought images of wartime conflict to the kitchen table. Newsmen like NBC's Frank McGee stated that the war was all but lost as a conclusion to be drawn inescapably from the facts. For the first time in American history, the media had the means to broadcast battlefield images. Graphic footage of casualties on the nightly news eliminated any myth of the glory of war. With no clear sign of victory in Vietnam, American military casualties helped stimulate opposition to the war by Americans. <laughs> 
In their book Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman challenge that traditional view of how the media influenced the war and propose that the media instead censored the more brutal images of the fighting and the death of millions of innocent people. Topic. Polarization If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read, Vietnam. The U.S. became polarized over the war. Many supporters of U.S. involvement argued for what was known as the domino theory, a theory that believed if one country fell to communism, then the bordering countries would be sure to fall as well, much like falling dominoes. This theory was largely held due to the fall of Eastern Europe to communism and the Soviet sphere of influence following World War II. However, military critics of the war pointed out that the Vietnam War was political and that the military mission lacked any clear idea of how to achieve its objectives. Civilian critics of the war argued that the government of South Vietnam lacked political legitimacy, or that support for the war was completely immoral. The media also played a substantial role in the polarization of American opinion regarding the Vietnam War. For example, in 1965 a majority of the media attention focused on military tactics with very little discussion about the necessity for a full-scale intervention in Southeast Asia. After 1965, the media covered the dissent and domestic controversy that existed within the United States, but mostly excluded the actual view of dissidents and resistors. The media established a sphere of public discourse surrounding the Hawk vs. Dove debate. The Dove was a liberal and a critic of the war. Doves claimed that the war was well intentioned but a disastrously wrong mistake in an otherwise benign foreign policy. It is important to note the Doves did not question the U.S. intentions in intervening in Vietnam, nor did they question the morality or legality of the U.S. intervention. Rather, they made pragmatic claims that the war was a mistake. Contrarily, the Hawks argued that the war was legitimate and winnable and a part of the benign U.S. foreign policy. The Hawks claimed that the one-sided criticism of the media contributed to the decline of public support for the war and ultimately helped the U.S. lose the war. Author William F. Buckley repeatedly wrote about his approval for the war and suggested that, "...the United States has been timid, if not cowardly, in refusing to seek victory in Vietnam." The Hawks claimed that the liberal media was responsible for the growing popular disenchantment with the war and blamed the Western media for losing the war in Southeast Asia as communism was no longer a threat for them. <laughs> Anti-war movement As the Vietnam War continued to escalate, public disenchantment grew and a variety of different groups were formed or became involved in the movement. <laughs> <laughs> Students There was a great deal of civic unrest on college campuses throughout the 1960s as students became increasingly involved in the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, and anti-war movement. Doug McAdam explains the success of the mass mobilization of volunteers for Freedom Summer in terms of biographical availability where individuals must have a certain degree of social, economic, and psychological freedom to be able to participate in large-scale social movements. This explanation can also be applied to the anti-war movement because it occurred around the same time and the same biographical factors applied to the college-aged anti-war protesters. David Myers 2007 also explains how the concept of personal efficacy affects mass movement mobilization. For example, according to Myers' thesis, consider that American wealth increased drastically after World War II. At this time, America was a superpower and enjoyed great affluence after 30 years of depression, war, and sacrifice. <laughs> 
Benjamin T. Harrison 2000 argues that the post-World War II affluence set the stage for the protest generation in the 1960s. His central thesis is that the World Wars and Great Depression spawned a beat generation refusing to conform to mainstream American values which lead to the emergence of the hippies and the counterculture. The anti-war movement became part of a larger protest movement against the traditional American values and attitudes. Myers 2007 builds off this claim in his argument that the relatively privileged enjoy the education and affirmation that afford them the belief that they might make a difference." As a result of the present factors in terms of affluence, biographical availability defined in the sociological areas of activism as the lack of restrictions on social relationships of which most likely increases the consequences of participating in a social movement, and increasing political atmosphere across the county, political activity increased drastically on college campuses. College enrollment reached 9 million by the end of the 1960s. Colleges and universities in America had more students than ever before, and these institutions often tried to restrict student behavior to maintain order on the campuses. To combat this, many college students became active in causes that promoted free speech, student input in the curriculum, and an end to archaic social restrictions. Students joined the anti-war movement because they did not want to fight in a foreign civil war that they believed did not concern them or because they were morally opposed to all war. Others disliked the war because it diverted funds and attention away from problems in the U.S. intellectual growth and gaining a liberal perspective at college caused many students to become active in the anti-war movement. Another attractive feature of the opposition movement was the fact that it was a popular social event. Most student anti-war organizations were locally or campus-based because they were easier to organize and participate in than national groups. Common anti-war demonstrations for college students featured attempts to sever ties between the war machine and universities through burning draft cards, protesting universities furnishing grades to draft boards, and protesting military and Dow chemical job fairs on campus. From 1969 to 1970, student protesters attacked 197 ROTC buildings on college campuses. Protests grew after the Kent State shootings, radicalizing more and more students. Although the media often portrayed the student anti-war movement as aggressive and widespread, only 10% of the 2,500 colleges in the United States had violent protests throughout the Vietnam War years. By the early 1970s, most student protest movements died down due to President Nixon's de-escalation of the war, the economic downturn, and disillusionment with the powerlessness of the anti-war movement. Topic. Arts Many artists during the 1960s and 1970s opposed the war and used their creativity and careers to visibly oppose the war. Writers and poets opposed to involvement in the war included Allen Ginsberg, Denise Levitoff, Robert Duncan, and Robert Bly. Their pieces often incorporated imagery based on the tragic events of the war as well as the disparity between life in Vietnam and life in the United States. Visual artists Ronald Haberl, Peter Saul, and Nancy Sparrow, among others, used war equipment like guns and helicopters, in their works while incorporating important political and war figures, portraying to the nation exactly who was responsible for the violence. Filmmakers such as Lenny Lipton, Jerry Abrams, Peter Gessner, and David Ringo created documentary-style movies featuring actual footage from the anti-war marches to raise awareness about the war and the diverse opposition movement. Playwrights like Frank O'Hara, Sam Shepard, Robert Lowell, Megan Terry, Grant Jouet, and Kenneth Bernard used theater as a vehicle for portraying their thoughts about the Vietnam War, often satirizing the role of America in the world and juxtaposing the horrific effects of war with normal scenes of life. 
regardless of medium, anti-war artists ranged from pacifists to violent radicals and caused Americans to think more critically about the war. Arda's war opposition was quite popular in the early years of the war, but soon faded as political activism became the more common and most visible way of opposing the war. Topic. Women Women were a large part of the anti-war movement, even though they were sometimes relegated to second-class status within the organizations or faced sexism within opposition groups. Some leaders of anti-war groups viewed women as sex objects or secretaries, not actual thinkers who could contribute positively and tangibly to the group's goals, or believed that women could not truly understand and join the anti-war movement because they were unaffected by the draft. Women involved in opposition groups disliked the romanticism of the violence of both the war and the anti-war movement that was common amongst male war protesters. Despite the inequalities, participation in various anti-war groups allowed women to gain experience with organizing protests and crafting effective anti-war rhetoric. These newfound skills combined with their dislike of sexism within the opposition movement caused many women to break away from the mainstream anti-war movement and create or join women's anti-war groups, such as Another Mother for Peace, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and Women's Strike for Peace also known as Women for Peace. Female soldiers serving in Vietnam joined the movement to battle the war and sexism, racism, and the established military bureaucracy by writing articles for anti war and antimilitary newspapers. Mothers and older generations of women joined the opposition movement, as advocates for peace and people opposed to the effects of the war and the draft on the generation of young men. These women saw the draft as one of the most disliked parts of the war machine and sought to undermine the war itself through undermining the draft. Another Mother for Peace and WSP often held free draft counseling centers to give young men legal and illegal methods to oppose the draft. Members of Women for Peace showed up at the White House every Sunday for eight years from 11 to 1 for a peace vigil. Such female anti-war groups often relied on maternalism, the image of women as peaceful caretakers of the world, to express and accomplish their goals. The government often saw middle-aged women involved in such organizations as the most dangerous members of the opposition movement because they were ordinary citizens who quickly and efficiently mobilized. Many women in America sympathized with the Vietnamese civilians affected by the war and joined the opposition movement. They protested the use of napalm, a highly flammable jelly weapon created by the Dow Chemical Company and used as a weapon during the war, by boycotting Saran Wrap, another product made by the company, faced with the sexism sometimes found in the anti war movement, New Left, and civil rights movement. Some women created their own organizations to establish true equality of the sexes. Some of frustrations of younger women became apparent during the anti-war movement, they desired more radical change and decreased acceptance of societal gender roles than older women activists. Female activists' disillusion with the anti-war movement led to the formation of the Women's Liberation Movement to establish true equality for American women in all facets of life. African Americans African American leaders of earlier decades like W. E. B. Du Bois were often anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist. Paul Robeson weighed in on the Vietnamese struggle in 1954, calling Ho Chi Minh, "...the modern-day Tucson Lovature, leading his people to freedom." These figures were driven from public life by McCarthyism, however, and black leaders were more cautious about criticizing U.S. foreign policy as the 1960s began. By the middle of the decade, open condemnation of the war became more common, with figures like Malcolm X and Bob Moses speaking out. Champion boxer Muhammad Ali risked his career and a prison sentence to resist the draft in 1966. 
Soon Martin Luther King Jr., Coretta Scott King and James Bevel of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference SCLC became prominent opponents of the Vietnam War, and the Black Panther Party vehemently opposed U.S. involvement in Vietnam. In the beginning of the war, some African Americans did not want to join the war opposition movement because of loyalty to President Johnson for pushing civil rights legislation, but soon the escalating violence of the war and the perceived social injustice of the draft propelled involvement in anti war groups. In 1965, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee became the first major civil rights group to issue a formal statement against the war. When SNCC backed Georgia Representative Julian Bond acknowledged his agreement with the anti war statement, he was refused his seat by the state of Georgia, an injustice which he successfully appealed up to the Supreme Court. SNCC had special significance as a nexus between the student movement and the black movement. At an SDS organized conference at UC Berkeley in October 1966, SNCC Chair Stokely Carmichael challenged the white left to escalate their resistance to the military draft in a manner similar to the black movement. Some participants in ghetto rebellions of the era had already associated their actions with opposition to the Vietnam War, and SNCC first disrupted an Atlanta draft board in August 1966. According to historians Joshua Bloom and Waldo Martin, SDS's first stop the draft week of October 1967 was inspired by black power and emboldened by the ghetto rebellions. SNCC appear to have originated the popular anti-draft slogan, "Hell no, we won't go." Black anti-war groups opposed the war for similar reasons as white groups, but often protested in separate events and sometimes did not cooperate with the ideas of white anti-war leadership. They harshly criticized the draft because poor and minority men were usually most affected by conscription. In 1965 and 1966, Afro-Americans comprised 25% of combat deaths, more than twice their proportion of the population. As a result, black enlisted men themselves protested and began the resistance movement among veterans. After taking measures to reduce the fatalities, apparently in response to widespread protest, the military brought the proportion of blacks down to 12.6% of casualties. African Americans involved in the anti war movement often formed their own groups, such as Black Women Enraged, National Black Anti War Anti Draft Union, and National Black Draft Counselors. Within these groups, however, many African American women were seen as subordinate members by black male leaders. Many African American women viewed the war in Vietnam as racially motivated and sympathized strongly with Vietnamese women. Such concerns often propelled their participation in the anti-war movement and their creation of new opposition groups. Asian Americans Many Asian Americans were strongly opposed to the Vietnam War. They saw the war as being a bigger action of U.S. imperialism and "...connected the oppression of the Asians in the United States to the prosecution of the war in Vietnam." Unlike many Americans in the anti-war movement, they viewed the war not just as imperialist but specifically as anti-Asian." Groups like the Asian American Political Alliance AAPA, the Bay Area Coalition Against the War and the Asian Americans for Action made opposition to the war their main focus. Of these organizations, the Bay Area Coalition Against the War was the biggest and most significant. One of the major reasons leading to their significance was that the BAACAW was "...highly organized, holding bi-weekly 90-minute meetings of the Coordinating Committee at which each regional would submit detailed reports and action plans." The driving force behind their formation was their anger at "...the bombing of Hanoi and the mining of Haiphong Harbor." 
Another aspect of the group's prevalence was the support of the Japanese Community Youth Center, members of the Asian Community Center, student leaders of Asian American student unions, etc. who stood behind it. The BAACAW members consisted of many Asians Americans and they were involved in anti-war efforts like marches, study groups, fundraisers, teach-ins and demonstrations. During marches, Asian American activists carried banners that read, "'Stop the bombing of Asian people and stop killing our Asian brothers and sisters.'" Its newsletter stated, "'Our goal is to build a solid, broad-based anti-imperialist movement of Asian people against the war in Vietnam." The anti-war sentiment by Asian Americans was fueled by the racial inequality that they faced in the United States. As historian Darrell Meader notes, "...the anti-war movement articulated Asian Americans' racial commonality with Vietnamese people in two distinctly gendered ways, identification based on the experiences of male soldiers and identification by women." Asian American soldiers in the U.S. military were many times classified as being like the enemy. They were referred to as gooks and had a racialized identity in comparison to their non-Asian counterparts. There was also the hypersexualization of Vietnamese women which in turn affected how Asian American women in the military were treated. In a Ghidra article, a prominent influential newspaper of the Asian American movement, Evelyn Yoshimura noted that the U.S. military systematically portrayed Vietnamese women as prostitutes as a way of dehumanizing them. Asian American groups realized in order to extinguish racism, they also had to address sexism as well. This in turn led to women's leadership in the Asian American anti war movement. Patsy Chan, a third world activist, said at an anti war rally in San Francisco, We, as third world women, express our militant solidarity with our brothers and sisters from Indochina. We, as third world people, know of the struggle the Indochinese are waging against imperialism, because we share that common enemy in the United States. Some other notable figures were Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama. Both Boggs and Kochiyama were inspired by the civil rights movement of the 1960s and, "...a growing number of Asian Americans began to push forward a new era in radical Asian American politics." There were also Asian American musicians who traveled around the United States to oppose the imperialist actions of the American government, specifically their involvement in Vietnam. The folk trio A Grain of Sand consisting of the members Joanne Nobuko, Miyamoto, Chris Ijima, and William, Charlie, Chin, performed across the nation as traveling troubadours who set the anti-racist politics of the Asian American movement to music. Quote, this band was so against the imperialistic actions of the United States, that they supported the Vietnamese people vocally through their song, War of the Flea. Asian American poets and playwrights also joined in unity with the movement's anti-war sentiments. Melvin Esqueta created the play, Honey Bucket, and was an Asian American veteran of the war. Through this play, Esqueta establishes equivalencies between his protagonist, a Filipino-American soldier named Andy, and the Vietnamese people. Quote, quote, the Asian American anti-war movement emerged from a belief that the mainstream peace movement was racist in its disregard to Asians. Steve Louis remembers that while the white anti-war movement had this moral thing about no killing, Asian Americans sought to bring attention to a bigger issue. Genocide The broader movement had a hard time with the Asian movement because it broadened the issues out beyond where they wanted to go. The whole question of U.S. imperialism as a system, at home and abroad. Topic. Clergy 
The clergy, often a forgotten group during the opposition to the Vietnam War, played a large role as well. The clergy covered any of the religious leaders and members including individuals such as Martin Luther King Jr. In his speech, "'Beyond Vietnam'," King stated, "'The greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent." King was not looking for racial equality through this speech, but tried to voice for an end to the war instead. The involvement of the clergy did not stop at King though. The analysis entitled, "'Social Movement Participation, Clergy and the Anti-Vietnam War Movement' expands upon the anti-war movement by taking King, a single religious figurehead, and explaining the movement from the entire clergy's perspective. The clergy were often forgotten though throughout this opposition. The analysis refers to that fact by saying, "...the research concerning clergy anti-war participation is even more barren than the literature on student activism." There is a relationship and correlation between theology and political opinions and during the Vietnam War, the same relationship occurred between feelings about the war and theology. This article basically was a social experiment finding results on how the pastors and clergy members reacted to the war. Based on the results found, they most certainly did not believe in the war and wished to help end it. Another source, Lift Up Your Voice Like a Trumpet, White Clergy and the Civil Rights and Anti-War Movements, 1954–1973 explains the story of the entire spectrum of the clergy and their involvement. Michael Friedland is able to completely tell the story in his chapter entitled, A Voice of Moderation, Clergy and the Anti-War Movement, 1966–1967. In basic summary, each specific clergy from each religion had their own view of the war and how they dealt with it, but as a whole, the clergy was completely against the war. Topic: Organizations. Committee for Nonviolent Action (CNVA), radical pacifist organization that blended philosophical anarchism with Gandhian pacifism. The organization used civil disobedience in direct action against military action. Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy Sane Liberal International Organization that was founded in 1957 by a group of nuclear pacifists. They attempted to increase public opinion in favor of their cause in an attempt to influence policy makers to halt atmospheric nuclear testing and reversing the arms race and the Cold War. Another committee was called SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Black Women Enraged, a Harlem anti-war movement. National Black Anti-War Anti-Draft Union NBAWADU, led by Gwen Patton and formed from black members of SNCC and socialist parties. National Black Draft Counselors NBDC, led by and created to help young black men avoid being drafted. Women's International League for Peace and Freedom WILPF, founded in 1919 after World War I and provided women with an early entry into the anti-war movement. The League of Women Voters, founded in 1920, was one of the first groups to call for an end to military involvement in Vietnam. Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, popularized the use of kneel-ins and prayer to end the war and stop its escalation. Bay Area Asian Coalition Against the War BAACAW. Asian American Political Alliance AAPA. Asian Americans for Action Third World Liberation Front TWLF, Some Asian American student organizations under this were, Filipino American Collegiate PACE, Asian American Political Alliance AAPA, and Chinese for Social Action ICSA. Vietnam Veterans Against the War 
Concerned Officers Movement, an organization of officers formed within the U.S. military. Movement for a Democratic Military, an anti-war and GI rights organization during the Vietnam War. GI Coffeehouses, coffeehouses created by anti-war activists as a method of supporting anti-war and anti-military sentiment among GIs. GIs Against Fascism, an organization of anti-war and anti-military GIs formed within the U.S. Navy in San Diego, California. American Writers and Artists Against the War in Vietnam Americans for Democratic Action FTA, a group whose initials either stand for Free the Army or Fuck the Army, depending on the situation, was led by Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland. Clergy and Laymen Concerned About Vietnam, CALCAV Wind Workshop in Nonviolence, magazine editors and staff included Maris Kakas, Marty Jezza, Paul Johnson, Susan Kent Kakas and Tad Richards. Published authors such as Grace Paley, Barbara Deming, Andrea Dworkin and Abby Hoffman. The Student Libertarian Movement, libertarian organization that was formed in 1972. The guiding principles of this organization were opposition to the war in Vietnam and opposition to the draft. The organization did not take a strong stand on racial issues. For example, in virtually hundreds of issues of libertarian newspapers, bulletins, and journals, the civil rights movement, black nationalism, or race in general composed no more than 1% of all articles surveyed. Students for Democratic Society SDS, founded in 1960 and was seen as one of the most active college campus groups of the New Left and the anti-war movement. Student Peace Union Furman University Corps of Kazoos, FUC, created to make fun of the military and campus ROTC program at Furman University in South Carolina. Such anti-campus ROTC groups were common throughout the U.S. Traditional peace groups like Fellowship of Reconciliation, American Friends Service Committee, the War Resisters League, and the Catholic Workers' Movement, became involved in the anti-war movement as well. Various committees and campaigns for peace in Vietnam came about, including Campaign for Disarmament, Campaign to End the Air War, Campaign to Stop Funding the War, Campaign to Stop the Air War, Catholic Peace Fellowship, and Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors. Music Waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool said to push on. Protest to American participation in the Vietnam War was a movement that many popular musicians appropriated, which was a stark contrast to the pro-war compositions of artists during World War II. These musicians included Joni Mitchell, Joan Baez, Phil Ox, Lou Harrison, Gail Kubik, William Mayer, Ely Siegmeister, Robert Fink, David Noon, Richard Wernick, and John W. Downey. The two most notable genres involved in this protest were rock and roll and folk music. While composers created pieces affronting the war, they were not limited to their music. Often protesters were being arrested and participating in peace marches and popular musicians were among their ranks. This concept of intimate involvement reached new heights in May 1968 when the Composers and Musicians for Peace concert was staged in New York. As the war continued, and with the new media coverage, the movement snowballed and popular music reflected this. As early as the summer of 1965, music-based protest against the American involvement in Southeast Asia began with works like P. F. Sloan's folk rock song Eva Destruction, recorded by Barry Maguire as one of the earliest musical protests against the Vietnam War. A key figure on the rock end of the anti-war spectrum was Jimi Hendrix 1942 to 1970, 
Hendrix had a huge following among the youth culture exploring itself through drugs and experiencing itself through rock music. He was not an official protester of the war. One of Hendrix's biographers contends that Hendrix, being a former soldier, sympathized with the anti communist view. He did, however, protest the violence that took place in the Vietnam War. With the song, Machine Gun, dedicated to those fighting in Vietnam, this protest of violence is manifest. David Henderson, author of Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky, describes the song as scary funk. His sound over the drone shifts from a woman's scream, to a siren, to a fighter plane diving, all amid Buddy Miles Gatling gun snare shots. He says, Evil man make me kill you. Make you kill me although we're only families apart. This song was often accompanied with pleas from Hendrix to bring the soldiers back home and cease the bloodshed. While Hendrix's views may not have been analogous to the protesters, his songs became anthems to the anti-war movement. Songs such as, Star Spangled Banner, showed individuals that, You can love your country, but hate the government. Hendrix's anti-violence efforts are summed up in his words. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Thus, Hendrix's personal views did not coincide perfectly with those of the anti war protesters, however, his anti violence outlook was a driving force during the years of the Vietnam War even after his death. 1970. The song known to many as the anthem of the protest movement was the Fish. Cheer, I Feel Like I'm Fixin' to Die Rag. First released on an EP in the October 1965 issue of Rag Baby by Country Joe and the Fish, one of the most successful protest bands. Although this song was not on music charts probably because it was too radical, it was performed at many public events, including the famous Woodstock Music Festival. 1969. Feel Like I'm Fixin' to Die Rag was a song that used sarcasm to communicate the problems with not only the war but also the public's naive attitudes towards it. It was said that, the happy beat and insouciance of the vocalist are in odd juxtaposition to the lyrics that reinforce the sad fact that the American public was being forced into realizing that Vietnam was no longer a remote place on the other side of the world, and the damage it was doing to the country could no longer be considered collateral, involving someone else. Along with singer-songwriter Phil Ox, who attended and organized anti-war events and wrote such songs as, I Ain't Marching Anymore, and, The War Is Over. Another key historical figure of the anti-war movement was Bob Dylan. Folk and rock were critical aspects of counterculture during the Vietnam War both were genres that Dylan would dabble in. His success in writing protest songs came from his pre-existing popularity, as he did not initially intend on doing so. Tor Eagle Forland, in his article, Bringing It All Back Home or Another Side of Bob Dylan, Midwestern Isolationist, quotes Todd Gitlin, a leader of a student movement at the time, in saying, Whether he liked it or not, Dylan sang for us. We followed his career as if he were singing our songs. The anthem, Blowin' in the Wind, embodied Dylan's anti war, pro civil rights sentiment. To complement, Blowin' in the Wind, Dylan's song, The Times They Are a Changin, alludes to a new method of governing that is necessary and warns those who currently participate in government that the change is imminent. Dylan tells the Senators and congressmen to please heed the call. Dylan's songs were designed to awaken the public and to cause a reaction. The protesters of the Vietnam War identified their cause so closely with the artistic compositions of Dylan that Joan Baez and Judy Collins performed The Times They Are a Chang'an. At a march protesting the Vietnam War 1965 and also for President Johnson. 
While Dylan renounced the idea of subscribing to the ideals of one individual, his feelings of protest towards Vietnam were appropriated by the general movement and they awaited his gnomic yet oracular pronouncements, which provided a guiding aspect to the movement as a whole. John Lennon, former member of the Beatles, did most of his activism in his solo career with wife Yoko Ono. Given his immense fame due to the success of the Beatles, he was a very prominent movement figure with the constant media and press attention. Still being proactive on their honeymoon, the newlyweds controversially held a sit-in, where they sat in bed for a week answering press questions. They held numerous sit-ins, one where they first introduced their song, Give Peace a Chance. Lennon and Ono's song overshadowed many previous held anthems, as it became known as the ultimate anthem of peace in the 1970s, with their words, All we are saying is give peace a chance, being sung globally. McCormick, Anita Louise. The Vietnam Anti War Movement in American History. Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, Enslow, 2000. Print. Topic. Growth Gruesome images of two anti-war activists who set themselves on fire in November 1965 provided iconic images of how strongly some people felt that the war was immoral. On November 2, 32-year-old Quaker Norman Morrison set himself on fire in front of the Pentagon. On November 9, 22-year-old Catholic Worker Movement member Roger Allen Laporte did the same in front of United Nations headquarters in New York City. Both protests were conscious imitations of earlier, and ongoing, Buddhist protests in South Vietnam. Protests against the Vietnam War took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The protests were part of a movement in opposition to the Vietnam War and took place mainly in the United States. See also Students for a Democratic Society, Free Speech Movement, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Youth International Party, Chicago 7. The growing anti-war movement alarmed many in the U.S. government. On August 16, 1966 the House UN American Activities Committee HUAC, began investigations of Americans who were suspected of aiding the NLF, with the intent to introduce legislation making these activities illegal. Anti-war demonstrators disrupted the meeting and 50 were arrested. In February 1967, the New York Review of Books published the Responsibility of Intellectuals, an essay by Noam Chomsky, one of the leading intellectual opponents of the war. In the essay Chomsky argued that much responsibility for the war lay with liberal intellectuals and technical experts who were providing what he saw as pseudoscientific justification for the policies of the U.S. government. On February 1, 1968, Nguyen Van Lam, a Viet Cong officer suspected of participating in murder of South Vietnamese government officials during the Tet Offensive, was summarily executed by General Nguyen Ngoc Lone, the South Vietnamese National Police Chief. Lone shot Lam in the head on a public street in Saigon front of journalists. South Vietnamese reports provided as justification after the fact claimed that Lem was captured near the site of a ditch holding as many as 34 bound and shot bodies of police and their relatives, some of whom were the families of General Lone's deputy and close friend. The execution provided an iconic image that helped sway public opinion in the United States against the war. The events at Tet in early 1968 as a whole were also remarkable in shifting public opinion regarding the war. U.S. military officials had previously reported that counterinsurgency in South Vietnam was being prosecuted successfully, 
While the Tet Offensive provided the U.S. and Allied militaries with a great victory in that the Viet Cong was finally brought into open battle and destroyed as a fighting force, the American media, including respected figures such as Walter Cronkite, interpreted such events as the attack on the American embassy in Saigon as an indicator of U.S. military weakness. The military victories on the battlefields of Tet were obscured by shocking images of violence on television screens, long casualty lists, and a new perception among the American people that the military had been untruthful to them about the success of earlier military operations, and ultimately, the ability to achieve a meaningful military solution in Vietnam. On October 15, 1969, hundreds of thousands of people took part in national moratorium anti-war demonstrations across the United States. The demonstrations prompted many workers to call in sick from their jobs and adolescents nationwide engaged in truancy from school. However, the proportion of individuals doing either who actually participated in the demonstrations is uncertain. A second round of moratorium demonstrations was held on November 15, but was less well attended. The U.S. realized that the South Vietnamese government needed a solid base of popular support if it were to survive the insurgency. To pursue this goal of winning the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people, units of the United States Army, referred to as civil affairs. Units were used extensively for the first time since World War II. Civil affairs units, while remaining armed and under direct military control, engaged in what came to be known as nation building, constructing or reconstructing schools, public buildings, roads and other infrastructure, conducting medical programs for civilians who had no access to medical facilities, facilitating cooperation among local civilian leaders, conducting hygiene and other training for civilians, and similar activities. This policy of attempting to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people, however, often was at odds with other aspects of the war which sometimes served to antagonize many Vietnamese civilians and provided ammunition to the anti-war movement. These included the emphasis on body count. As a way of measuring military success on the battlefield, civilian casualties during the bombing of villages, symbolized by journalist Peter Arnott's famous quote, it was necessary to destroy the village to save it", and the killing of civilians in such incidents as the My Lai Massacre. In 1974 the documentary Hearts and Minds sought to portray the devastation the war was causing to the South Vietnamese people, and won an Academy Award for Best Documentary amid considerable controversy. The South Vietnamese government also antagonized many of its citizens with its suppression of political opposition, through such measures as holding large numbers of political prisoners, torturing political opponents, and holding a one-man election for president in 1971. Covert counter-terror programs and semi-covert ones such as the Phoenix program attempted, with the help of anthropologists, to isolate rural South Vietnamese villages and affect the loyalty of the residents. Despite the increasingly depressing news of the war, many Americans continued to support President Johnson's endeavors. Aside from the domino theory mentioned above, there was a feeling that the goal of preventing a communist takeover of a pro-Western government in South Vietnam was a noble objective. Many Americans were also concerned about saving face in the event of disengaging from the war or, as President Richard M. Nixon later put it, achieving peace with honor. In addition, instances of Viet Cong atrocities were widely reported, most notably in an article that appeared in Reader's Digest in 1968 entitled The Blood Red Hands of Ho Chi Minh. However, anti-war feelings also began to rise. Many Americans opposed the war on moral grounds, appalled by the devastation and violence of the war. Others claimed the conflict was a war against Vietnamese independence, or an intervention in a foreign civil war, others opposed it because they felt it lacked clear objectives and appeared to be unwinnable. <laughs> 
Many anti-war activists were themselves Vietnam veterans, as evidenced by the organization Vietnam Veterans Against the War. In April 1971, thousands of these veterans converged on the White House in Washington, D.C., and hundreds of them threw their medals and decorations on the steps of the United States Capitol. By this time, it had also become commonplace for the most radical anti-war demonstrators to prominently display the flag of the Viet Cong enemy, an act which alienated many who were otherwise morally opposed to the war. Political factors In 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson began his re-election campaign. Eugene McCarthy ran against him for the nomination on an anti-war platform. McCarthy did not win the first primary election in New Hampshire, but he did surprisingly well against an incumbent. The resulting blow to the Johnson campaign, taken together with other factors, led the president to make a surprise announcement in a March 31 televised speech that he was pulling out of the race. He also announced the initiation of the Paris peace negotiations with Vietnam in that speech. Then, on August 4, 1969, U.S. Representative Henry Kissinger and North Vietnamese Representative Xuan Thuy began secret peace negotiations at the apartment of French intermediary Jean saint denis in Paris. After breaking with Johnson's pro-war stance, Robert F. Kennedy entered the race on March 16 and ran for the nomination on an anti-war platform. Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey, also ran for the nomination, promising to continue to support the South Vietnamese government. Draft Protests bringing attention to the draft began on May 5, 1965. Student activists at the University of California, Berkeley marched on the Berkeley Draft Board and 40 students staged the first public burning of a draft card in the United States. Another 19 cards were burnt on May 22 at a demonstration following the Berkeley teach-in. Draft card protests were not aimed so much at the draft as at the immoral conduct of the war. At that time, only a fraction of all men of draft age were actually conscripted, but the Selective Service System Office draft board in each locality had broad discretion on whom to draft and whom to exempt where there was no clear guideline for exemption. In late July 1965, Johnson doubled the number of young men to be drafted per month from 17,000 to 35,000, and on August 31, signed a law making it a crime to burn a draft card. On October 15, 1965 the student-run National Coordinating Committee to End the War in Vietnam in New York staged the first draft card burning to result in an arrest under the new law. In 1967, the continued operation of a seemingly unfair draft system then calling as many as 40,000 men for induction each month fueled a burgeoning draft resistance movement. The draft favored white, middle-class men, which allowed an economically and racially discriminating draft to force young African-American men to serve in rates that were disproportionately higher than the general population. Although in 1967 there was a smaller field of draft-eligible black men 29% versus 63% of draft-eligible white men 64% of black men were chosen to serve in the war through conscription, compared to only 31% of eligible white men, on October 16, 1967, draft card turn-ins were held across the country, yielding more than 1,000 draft cards, later returned to the Justice Department as an act of civil disobedience. Resistors expected to be prosecuted immediately, but Attorney General Ramsey Clark instead prosecuted a group of ringleaders including Dr. Benjamin Spock and Yale Chaplain William Sloan Coffin Jr. in Boston in 1968. 
By the late 1960s, one quarter of all court cases dealt with the draft, including men accused of draft dodging and men petitioning for the status of conscientious objector. Over 210,000 men were accused of draft related offences, 25,000 of whom were indicted. The charges of unfairness led to the institution of a draft lottery for the year 1970, in which a young man's birthday determined his relative risk of being drafted. September 14 was the birthday at the top of the draft list for 1970. The following year, July 9, held this distinction. The first draft lottery since World War II in the United States was held on 1 December 1969 and was met with large protests and a great deal of controversy. Statistical analysis indicated that the methodology of the lotteries unintentionally disadvantaged men with late year birthdays. This issue was treated at length in a January 4, 1970 New York Times article titled Statisticians charge draft lottery was not random. Various anti war groups, such as Another Mother for Peace, WILPF, and WSP, had free draft counseling centers, where they gave young American men advice for legally and illegally evading the draft. Over 30,000 people left the country and went to Canada, Sweden, and Mexico to avoid the draft. The Japanese anti-war group Bereren helped some American soldiers to desert and hide from the military in Japan. To gain an exemption or deferment, many men attended college, though they had to remain in college until their 26th birthday to be certain of avoiding the draft. Some men were rejected by the military as 4F unfit for service failing to meet physical, mental, or moral standards. Still others joined the National Guard or entered the Peace Corps as a way of avoiding Vietnam. All of these issues raised concerns about the fairness of who got selected for involuntary service, since it was often the poor or those without connections who were drafted. Ironically, in light of modern political issues, a certain exemption was a convincing claim of homosexuality, but very few men attempted this because of the stigma involved. Also, conviction for certain crimes earned an exclusion. The topic of the anti war song, Alice's Restaurant, by Arlo Guthrie. Even many of those who never received a deferment or exemption never served, simply because the pool of eligible men was so huge compared to the number required for service, that the draft boards never got around to drafting them when a new crop of men became available, until 1969, or because they had high lottery numbers, 1970 and later. Of those soldiers who served during the war, there was increasing opposition to the conflict amongst GIs, which resulted in fragging and many other activities which hampered the U.S.'s ability to wage war effectively. Most of those subjected to the draft were too young to vote or drink in most states, and the image of young people being forced to risk their lives in the military without the privileges of enfranchisement or the ability to drink alcohol legally also successfully pressured legislators to lower the voting age nationally and the drinking age in many states. Student opposition groups on many college and university campuses seized campus administration offices, and in several instances forced the expulsion of ROTC programs from the campus. Some Americans who were not subject to the draft protested the conscription of their tax dollars for the war effort. War tax resistance, once mostly isolated to solitary anarchists like Henry David Thoreau and religious pacifists like the Quakers, became a more mainstream protest tactic. As of 1972, an estimated 200,000 to 500,000 people were refusing to pay the excise taxes on their telephone bills, and another 20,000 were resisting part or all of their income tax bills. Among the tax resistors were Joan Byers and Noam Chomsky. Environment <inaudible> 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 
momentum from the protest organizations and the war's impact on the environment became focal point of issues to an overwhelmingly main force for the growth of an environmental movement in the United States. Many of the environment-oriented demonstrations were inspired by Rachel Carson's 1962 book Silent Spring, which warned of the harmful effects of pesticide use on the earth. For demonstrators, Carson's warnings paralleled with the United States' use of chemicals in Vietnam such as Agent Orange, a chemical compound which was used to clear forestry being used as cover, initially conducted by the United States Air Force in Operation Ranch Hand in 1962. <laughs> <laughs> Congressional hearings Topic: United Nations intervention. In October 1967, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held hearings on resolutions urging President Johnson to request an emergency session of the United Nations Security Council to consider proposals for ending the war. Topic: Delums war crimes. In January 1971, just weeks into his first term, Congressman Ron Dellums set up a Vietnam War Crimes exhibit in an annex to his congressional office. The exhibit featured four large posters depicting atrocities committed by American soldiers embellished with red paint. This was followed shortly thereafter by four days of hearings on war crimes in Vietnam, which began April 25. Dellums, assisted by the Citizens' Commission of Inquiry, had called for formal investigations into the allegations, but Congress chose not to endorse these proceedings. As such, the hearings were ad hoc and only informational in nature. As a condition of room use, press and camera presence were not permitted, but the proceedings were transcribed. In addition to Ron Dellums Dem CA, an additional 19 congressional representatives took part in the hearings, including Bella Abzug Dem NY, Shirley Chisholm Dem NY, Patsy Mink Dem High, Parin Mitchell Dem MD, John Conyers Dem Me, Herman Badillo Dem NY, James Abaric Dem SD, Leo Ryan Dem CA, Phil Burton Dem CA, Don Edwards Dem CA, Pete McCloskey Rep CA, Ed Koch Dem NY. John Seibling, Dem O, Henry Roos, Dem Y, Benjamin Stanley Rosenthal, Dem N Y, Robert Kastenmeier, Dem Y, and Abner J. Mikva, Dem Il. The transcripts describe alleged details of U.S. military's conduct in Vietnam. Some tactics were described as gruesome, such as the severing of ears from corpses to verify body count. Others involved the killing of civilians. Soldiers claimed to have ordered artillery strikes on villages which did not appear to have any military presence. Soldiers were claimed to use racist terms such as, "'Gooks' "'Dinks' and "'Slant Eyes' when referring to the Vietnamese. Witnesses described that legal, by the book instruction was augmented by more questionable training by non-commissioned officers as to how soldiers should conduct themselves. One witness testified about free fire zones, areas as large as 80 square miles, 210 square kilometers, in which soldiers were free to shoot any Vietnamese they encountered after curfew without first making sure they were hostile. Allegations of exaggeration of body count, torture, murder and general abuse of civilians and the psychology and motivations of soldiers and officers were discussed at length. Topic. Fulbright, end to war In April and May 1971, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, chaired by Senator J. William Fulbright, held a series of 22 hearings referred to as the Fulbright Hearings on proposals relating to ending the war. 
On the third day of the hearings, April 22, 1971, future Senator and 2004 presidential candidate John Kerry became the first Vietnam veteran to testify before Congress in opposition to the war. Speaking on behalf of Vietnam veterans against the war, he argued for the immediate, unilateral withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam. During nearly two hours of discussions with committee members, Kerry related in some detail the findings of the Winter Soldier investigation, in which veterans had described personally committing or witnessing atrocities and war crimes. Topic. Effects The opposition to the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War had many effects, which arguably led to the eventual end of the involvement of the United States. Howard Zinn, a controversial historian, states in his book A People's History of the United States that, in the course of the war, there developed in the United States the greatest anti-war movement the nation had ever experienced, a movement that played a critical role in bringing the war to an end. Topic. Fewer soldiers The first effect the opposition had that led to the end of the war was that fewer soldiers were available for the army. The draft was protested and even ROTC programs too. Howard Zinn first provides a note written by a student of Boston University on May 1, 1968, which stated to his draft board, I have absolutely no intention to report for that exam, or for induction, or to aid in any way the American war effort against the people of Vietnam. The opposition to the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War had many effects, which led to the eventual end of the involvement of the United States. This refusal letter soon led to an overflow of refusals ultimately leading to the event provided by Zinn stating, In May 1969 the Oakland Induction Center, where draftees reported from all of Northern California, reported that of 4,400 men ordered to report for induction, 2,400 did not show up. In the first quarter of 1970 the selective service system, for the first time, could not meet its quota. The fewer numbers of soldiers as an effect of the opposition to the war also can be traced to the protests against the ROTC programs in colleges. Zinn argues this by stating, "...student protests against the ROTC resulted in the cancelling of those programs in over 40 colleges and universities." In 1966, 191,749 college students enrolled in ROTC. By 1973, the number was 72,459. The number of ROTC students in college drastically dropped and the program lost any momentum it once had before the anti-war movement. Topic. College campuses A further effect of the opposition was that many college campuses were completely shut down due to protests. These protests led to wear on the government who tried to mitigate the tumultuous behavior and return the colleges back to normal. The colleges involved in the anti-war movement included one such as, Brown University, Kent State University, and the University of Massachusetts. Even at the College of William and Mary unrest occurred with protests by the students and even some faculty members that resulted in multiple informants hired to report to the CIA on the activities of students and faculty members. At the University of Massachusetts, the 100th commencement of the University of Massachusetts yesterday was a protest, a call for peace. 
red fists of protest, white peace symbols, and blue doves were stenciled on black academic gowns, and nearly every other senior wore an armband representing a plea for peace. Additionally, at Boston College, a Catholic institution, 6,000 people gathered that evening in the gymnasium to denounce the war. At Kent State University, on May 4, when students gathered to demonstrate against the war, National Guardsmen fired into the crowd. Four students were killed. Finally, at the Brown University commencement in 1969, two-thirds of the graduating class turned their backs when Henry Kissinger stood up to address them. Basically, from all of the evidence here provided by the historians, Zinn and McCarthy, the second effect was very prevalent and it was the uproar at many colleges and universities as an effect of the opposition to the United States' involvement in Vietnam. American soldiers Another effect the opposition to the war had was that the American soldiers in Vietnam began to side with the opposition and feel remorse for what they were doing. Zinn argues this with an example in which the soldiers in a POW camp formed a peace committee as they wondered who the enemy of the war was, because it certainly was not known among them. The statement of one of the soldiers reads, until we got to the first camp, we didn't see a village intact, they were all destroyed. I sat down and put myself in the middle and asked myself, is this right or wrong? Is it right to destroy villages? Is it right to kill people en masse? After a while it just got to me. Howard Zinn provides that piece of evidence to reiterate how all of this destruction and fighting against an enemy that seems to be unknown has been taking a toll on the soldiers and that they began to sense a feeling of opposition as one effect of the opposition occurring in the United States. Topic. Timeline Topic nineteen sixty four. On May twelfth, twelve young men in New York publicly burned their draft cards to protest the war. August, prompted by the Gulf of Tonkin incident, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. In December 1964, Joan Baez led six hundred people in an anti-war demonstration in San Francisco. Topic. 1965 On March 24, organized by Professors Against the War at the University of Michigan, a teach-in protest was attended by 2,500 participants. This model was to be repeated at 35 campuses across the country. On March 16, Alice Hertz, an 82-year-old pacifist, set herself on fire in the first known act of self-immolation to protest the Vietnam War. On April 17, the Students for a Democratic Society SDS, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee SNCC, a civil rights activist group, led the first of several anti-war marches in Washington, D.C., with about 25,000 protesters. Draft card burnings took place at University of California, Berkeley at student demonstrations in May organized by a new anti-war group, the Vietnam Day Committee. Events included a teach-in attended by 30,000, and the burning in effigy of President Lyndon B. Johnson. A Gallup poll in May showed 48% of U.S. respondents felt the government was handling the war effectively, 28% felt the situation was being handled badly, and the rest had no opinion. May, first anti-Vietnam War demonstration in London was staged outside the U.S. Embassy. Protests were held in June on the steps of the Pentagon, and in August, attempts were made by activists at Berkeley to stop the movement of trains carrying troops. 
A Gallup poll in late August showed that 24% of Americans view sending troops to Vietnam as a mistake, versus 60% who do not. By mid-October, the anti-war movement had significantly expanded to become a national and even global phenomenon, as anti-war protests drawing 100,000 were held simultaneously in as many as 80 major cities around the US, London, Paris, and Rome. On October 15, 1965, the first large-scale act of civil disobedience in opposition to the Vietnam War occurred when approximately 40 people staged a sit-in at the Ann Arbor, Michigan Draft Board. They were sentenced to 10 to 15 days in jail. On November 2, Norman Morrison, a 31-year-old pacifist, set himself on fire below the third-floor window of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara at the Pentagon, emulating the actions of the Vietnamese monk Thich Quang Duke. On November 27, Coretta Scott King, SDS President Carl Oglesby, and Dr. Benjamin Spock, among others, spoke at an anti-war rally of about 30,000 in Washington, D.C., in the largest demonstration to date. Parallel protests occurred elsewhere around the nation. On that same day, President Johnson announced a significant escalation of U.S. involvement in Indochina, from 120,000 to 400,000 troops. Topic: 1966. In February, a group of about 100 veterans attempted to return their military decorations to the White House in protest of the war, but were turned back. On March 26, anti-war demonstrations were held around the country and the world, with 20,000 taking part in New York City. A Gallup poll shows that 59% believe that sending troops to Vietnam was not a mistake. Among the age group of 21 to 29, 71% believe it was not a mistake compared to 48% of those over 50. On May 15, another large demonstration, with 10,000 picketers calling for an end to the war, took place outside the White House and the Washington Monument. June, the Gallup poll respondents supporting the U.S. handling of the war slipped to 41%, 37% expressed disapproval, and the rest had no opinion. A crowd of 4,000 demonstrated against the U.S. war in London on July 3 and scuffled with police outside the U.S. Embassy. 33 protesters were arrested. Joan Baez and A.J. Must organized over 3,000 people across the nation in an anti-war tax protest. Participants refused to pay their taxes or did not pay the amount designated for funding the war. Protests, strikes and sit-ins continued at Berkeley and across other campuses throughout the year. Three army privates, known as the Fort Hood Three refused to deploy in Vietnam, calling the war, "...illegal and immoral," and were sentenced to prison terms. Heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali, formerly known as Cassius Clay, declared himself a conscientious objector and refused to go to war. According to a writer for Sports Illustrated, the governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner Jr., called Ali, "...disgusting." and the governor of Maine, John H. Reed, said that Ali "...should be held in utter contempt by every patriotic American." In 1967 Ali was sentenced to five years in prison for draft evasion, but his conviction was later overturned on appeal. In addition, he was stripped of his title and banned from professional boxing for more than three years. In June 1966 American students and others in England meeting at the London School of Economics formed the Stop It Committee. The group was prominent in every major London anti-war demonstration. It remained active until the end of the war in April 1975. Topic 1967. The protest on June 23 in Los Angeles is singularly significant. 
It was one of the first massive war protests in the United States and the first in Los Angeles. Ending in a clash with riot police, it set a pattern for the massive protests which followed and due to the size and violence of this event, Johnson attempted no further public speeches in venues outside military bases. Another Mother for Peace group founded. January 14, 20,000 to 30,000 people staged a human be-in in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, near the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood that had become the center of hippie activity. In February, about 2,500 members of Women's Strike for Peace WSP marched to the Pentagon. This was a peaceful protest that became rowdier when the demonstrators were denied a meeting with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. February 8 – Christian groups opposed to the war staged a nationwide, "...fast for peace". February 23 – The New York Review of Books published, "...the responsibility of intellectuals", by Noam Chomsky as a special supplement. March 12 – A three-page anti-war ad appeared in the New York Times bearing the signatures of 6,766 teachers and professors. The advertisement spanned two and a quarter pages in Section 4, The Week in Review. The advertisement itself cost around $16,500 and was sponsored by the Inter-University Committee for Debate on Foreign Policy. March 17 – A group of anti-war citizens marched to the Pentagon to protest American involvement in Vietnam. March 25 – Martin Luther King Jr., a leader of the civil rights movement, led a march of 5,000 against the war in Chicago. April 4 – Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech in New York City, "...America rejected Ho Chi Minh's revolutionary government seeking self-determination." See details here on April 15, 400,000 people organized by the Spring Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam marched from Central Park to the UN Building in New York City to protest the war, where they were addressed by critics of the war such as Benjamin Spock, Martin Luther King, event initiator and director James Bevel, Harry Belafonte, and Jan Barry Crum, a veteran of the war. On the same date 100,000, including Coretta Scott King, marched in San Francisco. On April 24, Abby Hoffman led a small group of protesters against both the war and capitalism who interrupted the New York Stock Exchange, causing chaos by throwing fistfuls of both real and fake dollars down from the gallery. May 2 – British philosopher Bertrand Russell presided over the Russell Tribunal. In Stockholm, a mock war crimes tribunal, which ruled that the U.S. and its allies had committed war crimes in Vietnam. The proceedings were criticized as being a show trial. On May 22, the fashionable A Linovation department store in Brussels, Belgium burnt down, killing over 300 people amid speculation that the fire was caused by Belgian Maoists against the Vietnam War. On May 30 of January Crum and ten like-minded men attended a peace demonstration in Washington, D.C., and on June 1 Vietnam Veterans Against the War was born. In the summer of 1967, Neil Armstrong and various other NASA officials began a tour of South America to raise awareness for space travel. According to First Man, a biography of Armstrong's life, during the tour, several college students protested the astronaut, and shouted such phrases as, "'Murderers get out of Vietnam!' and other anti-Vietnam War messages. June 23, 1967 – President Johnson traveled to Los Angeles for a Democratic fundraiser. He was met by a massive anti-war protest on the street outside the hotel where he was speaking as Progressive Labour Party and SDS protesters at the head of a march halted. The riot act was read and 51 protesters arrested. This was one of the first massive war protests in the United States and the first in Los Angeles, ending in a clash with riot police. It set a pattern for the massive protests which followed. 
The vigor of the response from the LAPD, initially intended to prevent the demonstrators from storming the hotel where Johnson was speaking, was to a certain extent based on exaggerated reports from undercover agents which had infiltrated the organization sponsoring the protest. Unresisting demonstrators were beaten, some in front of literally thousands of witnesses, without even the pretext of an attempt to make an arrest. A crowd the Los Angeles Times reports at 10,000 clashed with 500 riot police outside President Johnson's fundraiser at the Century City Plaza Hotel. Expecting only 1,000 or 2,000 protesters, the LAPD field commander later told reporters he had been astounded by the size of the demonstration. Where did all those people come from? I asked myself. Scores were injured, including many peaceful middle-class protesters. Some sources put the crowd as high as 15,000 and noted that the police attacked the marchers with nightsticks to disperse the crowd. Due to the size and violence of this event, Johnson attempted no further public speeches in venues outside military bases. July 30 Gallup poll reported 52% of Americans disapproved of Johnson's handling of the war, 41% thought the U.S. made a mistake in sending troops, and over 56% thought the U.S. was losing the war or at an impasse. On August 28, 1967, U.S. Representative Tim Lee Carter RKY, stated before Congress, Let us now, while we are yet strong, bring our men home, every man jack of them. The Viet Cong fight fiercely and tenaciously because it is their land and we are foreigners intervening in their civil war. If we must fight, let us fight in defense of our homeland and our own hemisphere. On September 20, over 1,000 members of WSP rallied at the White House. The police used brutal tactics to try to limit it to 100 people, as per the law, or stop the demonstration, and the event tarnished the wholesome and nonviolent reputation of the WSP. In October 1967, Stop the Draft Week resulted in major clashes at the Oakland, California Military Induction Center, and saw more than a thousand registrants return their draft cards in events across the country. The cards were delivered to the Justice Department on October 20. Singer, musician activist Joan Baez, a longtime critic of the war in Vietnam, was among those arrested in the Oakland demonstrations. On October 18, 300 students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison attempted to prevent Dow Chemical Company, the maker of napalm, from holding a job fair on campus. The police eventually forced the demonstration to end, but Dow was banned from the campus. Three police officers and 65 students were injured in the event, dubbed, Dow Day. On October 21, 1967, the March on the Pentagon took place. A large demonstration organized by the National Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam, a crowd of nearly 100,000 met at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. and at least 30,000 people then marched to the Pentagon for another rally and an all-night vigil. Some, including Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and Allen Ginsberg, attempted to «exercise» and «levitate» the building, while others engaged in civil disobedience on the steps of the Pentagon. These actions were interrupted by clashes with soldiers and police. In all, 647 arrests were made. When a plot to airdrop 10,000 flowers on the Pentagon was foiled by undercover agents, some of these flowers ended up being placed in the barrels of MPs' rifles, as seen in famous photographs of the event such as Flower Power and the Ultimate Confrontation, the Flower and the Bayonet. Norman Mailer documented the events surrounding the march, and the march on the Pentagon itself, in his non-fiction novel, The Armies of the Night. In November 1967 a non-binding referendum was voted on in San Francisco, California which posed the question of whether there should be an immediate withdrawal of American troops from Vietnam. <laughs> 
the vote was 67% against the referendum, which was taken by a Johnson administration official as support for the war. Topic 1968. On January 15, 1968, over 5,000 women rallied in D.C. in the Jeanette Rankin Brigade protest. This was the first all-female anti-war protest intended to get Congress to withdraw all troops from Vietnam. On January 18, 1968, while in the White House for a conference about juvenile delinquency, black singer-entertainer Eartha Kitt yelled at Lady Bird Johnson about the generation of young men dying in the war. January 30, 1968 Tet Offensive was launched and resulted in much higher casualties and changed perceptions. The optimistic assessments made prior to the offensive by the administration and the Pentagon came under heavy criticism and ridicule as the "...credibility gap," that had opened in 1967 widened into a chasm. February – Gallup poll showed 35% approved of Johnson's handling of the war, 50% disapproved, the rest, no opinion. NYT – February 14, 68. In another poll that month, 23% of Americans defined themselves as doves and 61% hawks. March 12th anti-war candidate Eugene McCarthy received more votes than expected in the New Hampshire primary, leading to more expressions of opposition against the war. McCarthy urged his supporters to exchange the unkempt look rapidly becoming fashionable among war opponents for a more clean-cut style too in order not to scare voters. These were known as clean jeans. March 16 – Robert Kennedy joined the race for the U.S. presidency as an anti-war candidate. He was shot and killed on June 5, the morning after he won a decisive victory over McCarthy in the Democratic primary in California. March 17 – Major rally outside the U.S. Embassy in London's Grosvenor Square turned to a riot with 86 people injured and over 200 arrested. Over 10,000 had rallied peacefully in Trafalgar Square but met a police barricade outside the embassy. A UK Foreign Office report claimed that the rioting had been organised by 100 members of the German SDS who were "...acknowledged experts in methods of riot against the police." In March, Gallup poll reported that 49% of respondents felt involvement in the war was an error. April 17 – National media films the anti-war riot that breaks out in Berkeley, California. The overreaction by the police in Berkeley is shown in Berlin and Paris, sparking reactions in those cities. On April 26, 1968, a million college and high school students boycotted class to show opposition to the war. April 27 – An anti-war march in Chicago organized by Rennie Davis and others ended with police beating many of the marchers, a precursor to the police riots later that year at the Democratic Convention. During the 1968 Democratic National Convention, held August 26 to August 29 in Chicago, anti-war protesters marched and demonstrated throughout the city. Chicago Mayor Richard J. Daley brought to bear 23,000 police and National Guardsmen upon 10,000 protesters. Tensions between police and protesters quickly escalated, resulting in a "...police riot." Eight leading anti-war activists were indicted by the U.S. Attorney and prosecuted for conspiracy to riot. The convictions of the Chicago 7 were subsequently overturned on appeal. August – Gallup poll shows 53% said it was a mistake to send troops to Vietnam. Among the academic or scholarly groups was the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, founded in 1968 by graduate students and junior faculty in Asian Studies. Topic 1969. 
March polls indicated that 19% of Americans wanted the war to end as soon as possible, 26% wanted South Vietnam to take over responsibility for the war from the U.S., 19% favored the current policy, and 33% wanted total military victory. In March, students at Sunny Buffalo destroyed a Themis construction site. On March 5, Senator J. William Fulbright was prevented from speaking at the first national convocation on the challenge of building peace by members of the veterans and reservists to end the war in Vietnam. On April 6, a spontaneous anti-war rally in Central Park was recorded and later released as Environments 3. On May 22, the Canadian government announced that immigration officials would not and could not ask about immigration applicants' military status if they showed up at the border seeking permanent residence in Canada. On July 16, activist David Harris was arrested for refusing the draft, and would ultimately serve a 15 month prison sentence. Harris's wife, prominent musician, pacifist, and activist Joan Baez, toured and performed on behalf of her husband throughout the remainder of 1969, attempting to raise consciousness around the issue of ending the draft. On July 31, the New York Times published the results of a Gallup poll showing that 53% of the respondents approved of Nixon's handling of the war, 30% disapproved, and the balance had no opinion. On August 15–18, the Woodstock Festival was held at Max Yazga's farm in Bethel, New York. Peace was a primary theme in this pivotal popular music event. On October 15 the moratorium to end the war in Vietnam demonstrations took place. Millions of Americans took the day off from work and school to participate in local demonstrations against the war. These were the first major demonstrations against the Nixon administration's handling of the war. In October, 58% of Gallup respondents said U.S. entry into the war was a mistake. In November, Sam Melville, Jane Alpert, and several others bombed several corporate offices and military installations including the Whitehall Army Induction Center in and around New York City. On November 15, crowds of up to half a million people participated in an anti-war demonstration in Washington, D.C. and a similar demonstration was held in San Francisco. These protests were organized by the New Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam New Mobi and the Student Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam SMC. On December 7, the Fifth Dimension performed their song, Declaration, on The Ed Sullivan Show. Consisting of the opening of the Declaration of Independence through, For Their Future Security. It suggests that the right and duty of revolting against a tyrannical government is still relevant. In late December, the and Baby's poster is published, "...easily the most successful poster to vent the outrage that so many felt about the war in Southeast Asia." By end of the year, 69% of students identified themselves as doves. Topic 1970. On March 4, Antonia Martinez, a 21-year-old student at the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras, was shot and killed by a policeman while watching and commenting on the anti-Vietnam War and education reform student protests at the University of Puerto Rico. On March 14, two merchantsmen, claiming allegiance to the SDS, hijacked the SS Columbia Eagle, a U.S. flagged merchant vessel under contract with the U.S. government, carrying 10,000 tons of napalm bombs for use by the U.S. Air Force in the Vietnam War. The hijackers forced its master to divert to their neutral Cambodia, which promptly was taken over by anti-communists, who eventually returned to the ship to the U.S., 
Kent State, Cambodia invasion protest, Washington, D.C., after the Kent State shootings, on May 4, 100,000 anti-war demonstrators converged on Washington, D.C. to protest the shooting of the students in Ohio and the Nixon administration's incursion into Cambodia. Even though the demonstration was quickly put together, protesters were still able to bring out thousands to march in the capital. It was an almost spontaneous response to the events of the previous week. Police ringed the White House with buses to block the demonstrators from getting too close to the executive mansion. Early in the morning before the march, Nixon met with protesters briefly at the Lincoln Memorial but nothing was resolved and the protest went on as planned. National student strike, more than 450 university, college and high school campuses across the country were shut by student strikes and both violent and nonviolent protests that involved more than 4 million students, in the only nationwide student strike in U.S. history. A Gallup poll in May shows that 56% of the public believed that sending troops to Vietnam was a mistake, 61% of those over 50 expressed that belief compared to 49% of those between the ages of 21 to 29. On June 13, President Nixon established the President's Commission on Campus Unrest. The commission was directed to study the dissent, disorder, and violence breaking out on college and university campuses. In July 1970, the award-winning documentary The World of Charlie Company was broadcast. It showed GIs close to mutiny, balking at orders that seemed to them unreasonable. This was something never seen on television before. The documentary was produced by CBS News. On August 24, 1970, near 3.40 a.m., a van filled with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil mixture was detonated on the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Sterling Hall bombing. One researcher was killed and three others were injured. Vortex I, a biodegradable festival of life, to avert potential violence arising from planned anti-war protests, a government-sponsored rock festival was held near Portland, Oregon from August 28 to September 3, attracting 100,000 participants. The festival, arranged by the People's Army Jamboree, an ad hoc group, and Oregon Governor Tom McCall, was set up when the FBI told the governor that President Nixon's planned appearance at an American Legion convention in Portland could lead to violence worse than that seen at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. The Chicano Moratorium, on August 29, some 25,000 Mexican-Americans participated in the largest anti-war demonstration in Los Angeles. Police attacked the crowd with billy clubs and tear gas, two people were killed. Immediately after the marches were dispersed, sheriff's deputies raided a nearby bar, where they shot and killed Ruben Salazar, KMEX News Director and Los Angeles Times columnist, with a tear gas projectile. Topic. 1971 and after On April 23, 1971, Vietnam veterans threw away over 700 medals on the west steps of the Capitol building. The next day, anti-war organizers claimed that 500,000 marched, making this the largest demonstration since the November, 1969 march. Two weeks later, on May 5, 1971, 1146 people were arrested on the Capitol grounds trying to shut down Congress. This brought the total arrested during the 1971 May Day protests to over 12,000. Abby Hoffman was arrested on charges of interstate travel to incite a riot and assaulting a police officer. In August, 1971, the Camden 28 conducted a raid on the Camden, New Jersey draft board offices. The 28 included five or more members of the clergy, as well as a number of local blue-collar workers. 
Beginning December 26, 1971, 15 anti war veterans occupied the Statue of Liberty, flying a U.S. flag upside down from her crown. They left on December 28, following issuance of a federal court order. Also on December 28, 80 young veterans clashed with police and were arrested while trying to occupy the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. On March 29, 1972, 166 people, many of them seminarians, were arrested in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for encircling the federal courthouse with a chain, to protest the trial of the Harrisburg Seven. On April 19, 1972, in response to renewed escalation of bombing, students at many colleges and universities around the country broke into campus buildings and threatened strikes. The following weekend, protests were held in Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, and elsewhere. On May 13, 1972, protests again spread across the country in response to President Nixon's decision to mine harbors in North Vietnam and renewed bombing of North Vietnam Operation Linebacker. On July 6, 1972, four sisters of Notre Dame de Namur on a White House tour stopped and began praying to protest the war. In the next six weeks, such kneel-ins became a popular form of protest and led to over 158 protesters' arrests. <laughs> Public opinion on the Vietnam War The American public's support of the Vietnam War decreased as the war continued on. As public support decreased, opposition grew. The Gallup News Service began asking the American public whether it was a mistake to send troops to Vietnam in August 1965. At the time, less than a quarter of Americans polled, 24%, believed it was a mistake to send troops to Vietnam, while 60% of Americans polled believed the opposite. Three years later, in September 1968, 54% of Americans polled believed it was a mistake to send troops to Vietnam, while 37% believed it was not a mistake. A 1965 Gallup poll asked the question. Have you ever felt the urge to organize or join a public demonstration about something? Positive responses were quite low, not many people wanted to protest anything, and those who did want to show a public demonstration often wanted to demonstrate in support of the Vietnam War. However, when the American public was asked in 1990, Looking back, do you wish that you had made a stronger effort to protest or demonstrate against the Vietnam War, or not? 25% said they wished they had. A major factor in the American public's disapproval of the Vietnam War came from the casualties being inflicted on U.S. forces. In a Harris poll from 1967 asking what aspect most troubled people most about the Vietnam War the plurality answer of 31% was, "...the loss of our young men." A separate 1967 Harris poll asked the American public, "...how has the war affected your own family, job or financial life?" The majority of respondents, 55%, said that it had had no effect on their lives. Of the 45% who indicated the war had affected their lives, 32% listed inflation as the most important factor, while 25% listed casualties inflicted. As the war continued, the public became much more opposed to the war, seeing that it was not ending. In a poll from December 1967, 71% of the public believed the war would not be settled in 1968. A year later the same question was asked and 55% of people did not think the war would be settled in 1969. When the American public was asked about the Vietnam era anti-war movement in the 1990s, 39% of the public said they approved, while 39% said they disapproved. The last 22% were unsure. Topic. Slogans and chants 
Hell, no, we won't go, was heard in anti draft and anti war protests throughout the country. Bring the troops home now, was heard in mass marches in Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, Berkeley, New York, and San Diego. Thou shall not kill, and making money burning babies were two slogans used by students at UCLA and other colleges to protest the Dow Chemical Company, the maker of napalm and Agent Orange. Stop the war, feed the poor, was a popular slogan used by socially conscious and minority anti-war groups, protesting that the war diverted funds that struggling Americans desperately needed. Girls say yes to men who say no was an anti-draft slogan used by the SDS and other organizations. "'War is not healthy for children and other living things' was a slogan of another mother for peace, and was popular on posters. "'End the nuclear race, not the human race' was first used by the WSP in anti-nuclear demonstrations and became incorporated into the anti-war events. Not my son, not your son, not their sons, was an anti war and anti draft slogan used by the WSP during protests. Ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh, the Viet Cong are gonna win, was a common anti war chant during anti war marches and rallies in the later 60s. Hey, hey, LBJ! How many kids did you kill today? was especially chanted by students and other marchers and demonstrators in opposition to Lyndon B. Johnson. One, two, three, four, we don't want your fucking war, was chanted in marches from Brisbane to Boston. Fuck, fuck, fuck it all. We don't want this anymore, was also chanted in marches from Brisbane to Boston. Amara Nama Tamara Nama Bietanama. Your name, my name Vietnam, slogans chanted by leftists of Kolkata the then Calcutta against the American oppression on Vietnam. Topic See also Equals equals notes. <laughs>